Hello, welcome back to Evolving Paradigms in Castration-Resistant Prostate Cancer. We're now going to move to Case 2. Case 2 is a 56-year-old man who was treated for a Gleason 8 prostate cancer about a year ago, and he experiences a rapid rise in PSA and starts ADT. About two years after starting the ADT, his PSA begins to rise. At that time, imaging reveals small pelvic nodes, a solitary bone metastasis in, let's say, the thoracic spine, and a PSA of 25. Dr. Sarter, what's your initial thinking on this case? Well, so, so first of all, I, I want to make sure that this patient is very well staged. And, you know, there is the possibility that if we scan a little more and make sure that we don't have visceral metastasis, because that can put the patient into a little bit of a different category. So small pelvic nodes, solitary bone mats, PSA at 25. So this is almost an oligometastatic disease, but it's in the face of being treated with ADT, and so now castrate resistant, obviously. So this is a very, very interesting case. And what I've been doing under these circumstances is, first of all, to evaluate that solitary bone metastasis in some amount of detail. And I am not adverse to even radiating an oligometastatic disease if I think that it could be clinically relevant. Now let me tell you a recent study that I thought was absolutely fascinating. So one of the studies recently that was published demonstrates a tracking of metastasis from one spot to another. Mm -hmm. And in that particular um, study, they showed that metastasis begat other metastasis. And we have a bone metastasis, and the concept of maybe sterilizing that with radiation and treating it with something like abiraterone or enzalutamide at the same time actually has sort of an appeal to me. Just these small pelvic nodes. So I'm even considering the possibility of radiating that solitary bone mat and then adding an abbey or enza simultaneously and trying to eliminate as much disease as I can and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Dr. Petrolak? So, you know, this patient, uh, if, if we look at the PSA quartile data from the ProVenge trial, that's basically demonstrating that those patients who have the best response to immune therapy are the ones with the lower PSAs, and the cutoff is 22. So he just sort of misses that, mm -hmm. that particular area. But, you know, it's interesting that, um, you know, giving immune therapy early is felt to be better mm -hmm. overall. We do see induction of memory T cells in some situations that can be found up to seven years afterwards. And we know that these immune treatments tend to take time to work. He has bone metastases, he's, he would be eligible for this. And, you know, I like Oliver's concept of, of, of radiating a solitary met in addition to doing immune therapy. Perhaps we can, uh, can exploit the Epscopal effect uh, in this situation. So I, I probably would go with immune therapy first, possibly radiation therapy even preceding that, uh, but uh, rather than going with, with another antiandrogen agent, I probably would save that for a little bit later. Well, let's make the counter argument. Let's say that we uh, did a sodium fluoride PET scan, which many of our centers are uh, experimenting with and, and using, uh, and we found that there were multiple spots in the, in the spine uh, on this sodium fluoride PET scan, yet the standard technetium bone scan shows only the solitary bone mat. Does that, how does that change your thinking, and what are, what are your thinking, what's your thinking in general about novel imaging modalities in a case like this? No, so great, great question. Um, if they're oligometastatic on sodium fluoride PET, it has a different meaning than if they're oligometastatic on, on the bone scan. And unequivocally, the sodium fluoride PET is a more sensitive test. So if I were to have a solitary bone mat, rating it, it makes sense. If I have a multiplicity of bone mats, it doesn't. Getting, get, getting back to, to Dan's uh, comment, which I think is a very good one, you know, this, this is in fact the type of patient that, that simple cell T could be considered for. And we've used a fair amount of it, and I know you've used probably much more than I have, and, and it could be that that could be an interesting way to approach it. Um, I might get to ask a question if you don't mind. Of course. And that is that, you know, so in this sort of Abby Enza sort of scenario, if, do you have a preference in the context of simple cell T, and do you think that 5-BID of prednisone might make a difference, because that'll be what you use with abiraterone right. or ACE typically? So there's a couple of points there. Number one is, I thought it was great that you brought up the quartile data from the Cipula CLT mm -hmm. study. There are similar quartile data from the Cougar 302 study, and the quartiles are about the same. I mean, the border lines are about the same. Right. So this patient is right at the border of the very good uh, quartile mm -hmm. versus the early intermediate, if you will, uh, based solely on PSA. 
Um, so I think the patient's likelihood of benefiting from either one of those therapies is high, and I would also throw into that enzalutamide. So mm -hmm. this patient really has three standard options available. We've had a nice discussion about the non-standard option of mm -hmm. doing radiation, which I really like because um, I, I agree we do, I think we may miss the opportunity to really eradicate a strong, a significant proportion of disease, the seeding metastasis. So I radiate solitary mets quite frequently, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in particular for the patient who has hormone sensitive disease, which is not this case, but, mm. uh, but that's a separate story. So if I'm gonna, my rule on Sapulaxil is if I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna use it before abiraterone and enzalutamide and chemotherapy. I never use it after anymore. Um, and I also take a look at the patient's overall situation, prognosis, et cetera. And as you're both aware, the, the, the data on the difference between placebo and, and Sapulaxil T was greatest after three years of follow-up. Now, in the, in, this is in the, um, uh, the, the pivotal phase three study. Um, now, that was a mi minority of the patients, but the idea is if the patient has a high likelihood of living three years, you're gonna increase mm -hmm. that likelihood mm -hmm. with Sapulacil. So this is a patient I probably would treat. Uh, and you know he's 56, young man, uh, and so uh, I would treat him with Sapulacil, and then I would most likely integrate the next therapy at some date that is uh, as yet undetermined. You, rose, you raised the point of, is the prednisone of abiraterone a bad thing when somebody's receiving Sapulacil? Uh, my colleague Eric Small led a study that's been now presented at a couple of meetings, uh, which shows that the immune parameters do not appear to be affected significantly by the prednisone. That's different from saying, is Sapulacil as effective? But it doesn't, we don't, we right. at least don't see any overt change in the immune profile from the prednisone, which is, mm -hmm. I think, surprising to some of us. Mm -hmm. So I would have no problem whatsoever uh, giving Sapulacil and then immediate abiraterone. Um, and in fact, that study that I just quoted, there, they looked at immediate abiraterone versus concurrent abiraterone. So right. that's an important point, which is if, if, if you desire to do so, giving it concurrent abiraterone is a reasonable thing to do from that perspective. In reality, I give the Sapulacil, and then I observe for a period of time, and then I'll start the next therapy. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's, that's generally what I would do. Uh, I would start the Sapulacil, observe, see how their PSAs are doing. If they start taking off, then that's when I would intervene with either abiraterone or enzalutamide. You know, the important point about uh, Dr. Small's trial is the fact that this was not designed to look at survival as a randomized phase two with about 35 patients in right. both arms. So yes, you can conclude that the immune parameters are no different, but does this have an effect on survival? We don't know. Uh, we just presented some data at this meeting in a very, very similar trial using enzalutamide, given that at the beginning of Cipulucil T treatment and then delaying it until six weeks afterwards, very similar mm -hmm. design to uh, Eric's trial. And we found no difference in immune parameters. We we're actually looking to see a stimulation because mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Drake has shown in the laboratory that enzalutamide may actually uh, uh, stimulate uh, the immune system. But w at least, f at least as, as of this current analysis, we've not seen it. Do either, uh, either one of you want to comment on the other immunotherapies that are out mm -hmm. there that might be coming that are uh, of interest? Sure. So uh, there are a couple of immunotherapy trials, phase three, that we're looking for readouts right now. Uh, one of them is Ipilimumab, which is already FDA approved in the melanoma setting. And that trial is completely accrued. It turned out that there were two trials. It was a post docetaxel and a pre docetaxel The post docetaxel just missed. The p-value was 0 0.053. And if they'd excluded probably the visceral disease from that particular trial, they probably would have had a positive mm -hmm. one. Now, in the pre docetaxel trial, which is yet to report, they didn't have visceral match. That was actually an exclusion, as I understood it. And so there was a lot of people who are hoping that that could be a positive trial. But of course, until it reads, we don't know. Yeah. It also is a little more complicated because we've had Abianenza be introduced. Uh, we've had radium introduced. Cabazitaxel now part of standard of care. And so there are a lot of therapies that could follow, in which case we're not really looking at A versus B. But we're looking at A, B, C, D, and right, E right. versus B, C, D, and right, E. Right, right, right. So, well, you know, I, I mean, you know, we just have to, to, you know, we have to wait for the trial to, to, to give us a, um, an answer, and then we'll see what it is. So the other one is the, the Poxviral one, the Prospect VF Tracom, a little company called Bavarian Nordic has, has promoted that. It really is in a asymptomatic, uh, relatively low volume mm -hmm. um, metastatic disease. And again, it's accrued. And we just have to wait and see what's going to happen. Uh, 
so I mean, I, I think that, that it's going to be interesting to see what that trial shows, again, because of what, what Dr. Sardis said in terms of subsequent treatments. Um, I think the vaccine trials are very, very interesting, uh, particularly PROSFAC. Uh, but you know, now some of the other checkpoint inhibitors are being evaluated in castration-resistant prostate cancer. And um, we'll see what those show. But you know, the general sense is that PD ligand and PD-1 are not expressed at the same rates as we would see in other solid tumors. So there may be something innate about prostate cancer that the immunologic milieu and the, the, the stroma is very, very different. Uh, than what uh, what we're seeing with other tumors. Right, and yeah. I would add that the, the extent of disease appears to matter with respect to immunology. I mean, we talked about the quartiles of PSA with sepulosil. That's a relatively simplistic way to look at it. You talked about the, uh, the issue of liver metastasis. Mm -hmm. The immunologists think that the liver is essentially an immunosuppressive, or a, mm -hmm. you know, a, an immune uh, suppressive environment that keeps immune right. therapies out is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it will be important for us uh, in particular, if that ipilimumab study is positive, for us to really get a sense as to, again, subsets really matter, I think. Who are the patients who benefited mm -hmm. the most? And, and because when we're trying to make decisions for individual patients, it's critically important. Yeah, one, one very brief comment. So nivolumab, which has turned out to be the PD-1 inhibitor, very, very active in a number of settings. I mean, renal cell, melanoma, et cetera. It turns out that there were 17 prostate cancer patients in the phase one published in the New England Journal zero out of 17 yeah. responded. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm pessimistic, yeah. but I'm just saying we got a lot more work to do. That may not be the immunotherapy for prostate cancer. It might be Absolutely. one of the other ones. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna put you both on the spot. You've got this patient, let's say we treated him with sepulosil. What do you do next? Do you do abiraterone? Do you do enzalutamide? Dr. Petrolak. So I think you've got to look at the patient again. Uh, this, this selection process between the two drugs is individualized. So if the patient has a seizure history, or my sense is if they're very frail, that uh, and, and they have a baseline of fatigue, they don't tolerate the enzalutamide as well as they would if they are a little bit more robust. Uh, having said that, I've started patients at half dose. I've given them treatment, uh, given them, had them take their dose at nighttime to try to alleviate the fatigue issues. I've Either if they've started at high dose, I've, uh, standard dose, I dose reduce them. So there are ways that you can manipulate this to try to overcome that. Uh, uh, abiraterone, uh, certainly if they have a history of uh, congestive heart failure, fluid retention because of the prednisone, you'd like to stay away from that and perhaps go to enzalutamide instead. Um, also, uh, liver function abnormalities is something you'd like to uh, avoid in somebody who's, who's on abiraterone. Uh, so you know, I think that you have to individualize it again for the, uh, mm -hmm. for the patient. There's no right or wrong answer to this. Yeah, well put. I actually think that yeah. you know you really hit the nail on the head with the fatigue. I actually think that there are probably patients out there who are not hurt by the prednisone, but actually benefit from the prednisone. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, patients with even minor pain or, or who pre-existing fatigue. Uh, I find that many patients actually perk up a little bit when they get a low dose of prednisone. Right, but the, the problems are A, once you get them on it, it's difficult yep. to get them off. Mm -hmm. And then B, there's that subgroup analysis that was done uh, on the second line enzalutamide trial where prednisone show, was shown to be an independent poor prognostic marker right. for these patients. So is that an interaction? Is that something to do with the changes in the hormonal status uh, where there's a shift towards uh, the progesterone receptor? It's not really, really known. Right. So I think we need, again, more information on that. Dr. Yeah. Sarger? Well, you know, what was well, kind of interesting, um, Chuck, there's, there's a trial that you're the PI on called IMAGINE or PCR 2005. That trial doesn't use 5-BID of prednisone, it's just five a day. Right. And it turns out that you can do really pretty well on just five of prednisone. Now, generally in these metastatic settings, I start out 5-BID, but based on that data, I have had no trouble kind of ratcheting down a little bit if I think there's some prednisone yeah. side Absolutely. effects. Yeah. And you know, five and 2.5, or maybe just five in the morning, and you know, the patients do pretty well. Right, so two other points about that. The IMAGINE study that you just quoted is a study of abiraterone plus low-dose prednisone in non-metastatic CRPC, yes. in which we observed an 87% uh, proportion of patients having a 50% decline in PSA. And many patients, we haven't yet reached median PFS, and mm -hmm. so many patients are on for two years and, and ongoing. Uh, so that suggests that abiraterone is, it also suggests that abiraterone is safe with low-dose prednisone in the long run, which mm -hmm. is, I think, one of the key aspects yep. to it. 
It's also important, I think, that uh, to not forget that before we had all these drugs, we used corticosteroids all the time, and we recorded, mm -hmm. we reported responses mm -hmm. to them. And in in fact, in the 302 Cougar study, um, about 25 percent of patients actually had a response to the prednisone. So it may, in fact, yeah. be adding to uh, to the um, the clinical response. But mm -hmm. I think it's important that the three of us kind of agree that there's really no number one drug in this setting that mm -hmm. must be chosen over the other, mm -hmm. that both choices are reasonable. I think you've really nicely said that mm -hmm. this is an individualized uh, uh, situation, a situation where you get to know your patient and, and what's their daily life like, mm -hmm. what do they want to get out of that treatment, um, and, uh, and, and how pre-existing conditions can be uh, worsened by some of the toxicities of these drugs. You know, I'll mention one other thing briefly, and that is sometimes the out-of-pocket expenses for the patient can vary pretty dramatically right. between the two drugs, and that's sort of formulary dependent. And you can prescribe, you know, one drug and then another drug for the same patient and turn out with a difference in the out-of-pocket costs being $500, $700 a month. So at times the cost considerations can be very real. So let me pick up on that point and say that, all right, if costs are an issue, why not wait three months before you start any drug? You, then you're spending zero dollars on, on any therapy uh, for that time period. Is this patient at risk? He has a PSA of 25, a solitary bone met, and some pelvic lymph nodes. Why not just wait till his PSA is 50? Um, you know, I don't quite feel comfortable with that in a patient yeah. who's clearly progressing. I mean, this is a patient with bone metastatic disease. He's got some nodes. He's, he's, he's progressing after the ADT. You know, he's coming in to me for some help, and, you know, I'm going to be able to try to help him better if I intervene now, not later. Well, in my own personal practice, I will occasionally observe these patients for a mm -hmm. period of time. What I do not do is I do not wait for them to get symptoms. Oh, absolutely. Because we mm -hmm. clearly know yep. that once a patient develops symptoms, that their prognosis has it goes down a step. Right. Yep. And, and so I'm trying to imply that, you know, I have patients, as I'm sure you do, who may have life events or things like that where they don't want to start a new therapy right away, waiting a month or two months, maybe sometimes three is fine. Yeah. But I don't pick a clinical deterioration as my trigger yeah. point for starting therapy. Well, well you know, that there was this guy by the name of Chuck Ryan, and you may have seen his abstract on the prognostic indices yeah. within some of these abiraterone trials. I wonder if we could ask him to cover that in a little more detail well, for us. Well, there are a couple of prognostic indices. There's the one that we just developed and, and is in a poster form. Susan mm -hmm. Hollaby has uh, published this extensively uh, in the JCO, and, and her model is probably the best one to cite, which is very clinically useful, but it's a prognostic nomogram, not a predict predictive one. So, mm -hmm. But it does help to define where a patient sits on the spectrum of the disease. And I think the, it's, it's published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and I encourage clinicians to use it because it, it, is self, it educates you about the disease. But the, the factors that are of most uh, importance are the absence or presence of pain. That is a huge differential mm -hmm. uh, in prognosis uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, LDH is probably the most important mm -hmm. biomarker that we have in all of prostate cancer, and yet it's probably also the oldest blood test, that, one of the oldest uh, tests that we have available. Uh, and, uh, and, and PSA is actually of not as great a value as one might mm -hmm. think, uh, because there are patients with high PSAs who do quite well, and, and patients with low PSAs who, who, who unfortunately do not have a clinical response to, to, to therapies. So um, I look at ALKFAS, LDH, hemoglobin, mm -hmm. um, all of which tell us about the burden of the disease on the patient. I look at pain, uh, I look at uh, PSA, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and, and help make, try to make those decisions based on that situation. I, I think it's really interesting, the consistency of those markers, yeah. because I published that back in 1991. Yeah. Uh, with you know chemotherapy trials that were inactive, mm -hmm. and and showed that the the log of the alkaline phosphatase and the LDH w and hemoglobin were the most mm -hmm. important prognostic right. factors. Right. So I, I just think it's really great that we're s still seeing the, these these markers and uh, showing that they are useful in helping us determine what to do with our. And patients. despite all the progress in circulating tumor cells mm -hmm. and genomics and things like that, sometimes you know the simplest tests are good to have because you can get them every month and you can. Right. You can get them in every lab, and, and, and that's really good. So it's really important to think about these things and try to put the patient on the spectrum of the disease mm -hmm. progression while exactly. making these clinical decisions. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Great. So this has been case number two, and uh, it's been a good discussion on this topic, which is, of course, very timely and uh, very common in, in the clinic.